boxes in your regional. And my job uh, was to get all these boxes that we had piled up around us into the truck and into the new house before the baby came. Also, because I'm a, a free soft, software activist and I tend to make people's lives in our family a little bit harder by using free software for everything. It was also my job to get a free software solution to sharing photos with our family and our, our friends and all this sort of stuff. So that's how I got, got introduced to Media Goblin. So a few days later, I've got Media Goblin set up. It's all ready to go. Uh, we've got all the boxes unpacked into the house and we've unpacked most of the things. And then my brother comes running in with the phone. And uh, uh, more on that later. So GNU Media Goblin is a publishing system for artists. It's for painters, for illustrators, for musicians, for 3D modelers, and for speakers. And it's for collecting and curating and publishing beautiful and interesting things. It's also not just for software people, as opposed to a lot of the software we write. This is actually for artists. <clears throat> and some of these, these lovely pictures uh, and the puns are thank, thanks to Chris Weber and Deb Nicholson from the Media Goblin Project. So, I'll show you Media Goblin. <clears throat> All right. So what I'll do here is, in my terminal, I'll just uh, start up the Media Goblin process. I'll also flick over to this one and start up a secondary process that does the, does the work, which I'll tell you a little bit about later. So what this is saying is it started up a web server on this address here, so I'll open that up. Close that one. Uh, I'll just log out so you can see the, the whole experience. So this is Media Goblin. It's a, it's a web interface. Uh, you get you know, people access the media through a web browser at the moment, but I'll show you a little bit more about that later on other options. Uh, I've, I've added one piece of media here, which I'll show you in a second. Um, that's because it was a video and it takes some time to transcode. I didn't want to make you sit here while it transcoded. So, uh, as a, a, an artist, I, I first uh, create an account, but I have one of those, so I'll log in. Whoops. It has my password already. Okay. All right, so it tells me this is the recent media. So what I'll go and do is I'll select Add Media from the menu, Browse. Now, there are some things that are more important to me than free software. I know that might be hard to believe, but... Uh, for example, cake. So this is uh, this is uh, some cake. Uh, let's just put a description here for the sake of it. Well, sorry, thanks. <laughs> Tags, uh, cake, I guess. Add. <clears throat> so Media Goblins just said to me, "Great, we've submitted a piece of media." Uh, and it hasn't shown up here just yet. Um, the reason why that is is because Media Goblin runs a secondary process that does the actual transcoding uh, of media, which we'll talk more about in a minute. But if we then go and refresh in a few seconds, uh, there's our piece of media. So we've got this lovely photo of a piece of some cake. And if we click in there, we can we get a big view of it. Uh, we've got uh, we, we, we've got information about the tags, the, the license that I've licensed it under. The title, the description, people can add comments. Add this comment. <clears throat> you can use Markdown for the description, so you can add hyperlinks, all this sort of stuff. Uh, and because I'm the author, I can edit it and delete it. <clears throat> uh, so let's try something else. So that's a, that's a photo. But Media Goblin is cross-media, so unlike a lot of the media publishing systems you might be used to, that publish just video or just audio or just uh, slides or just 3D models. Media Goblin does it all and more. So let's grab something else. Uh, this one. We need an alarm to remind us when to put the chooks in at home. Uh, that's chickens if you're not an Australian. So chooky, chook. 
Oh, there we go. Alarm to remember chooks that I've already used. Um, so, okay, add my tag for chook. Add, okay, so uh, let me just see if I can pop up this. Oh no, that won't be very interesting. I'll show you, I'll show you the, um, the transcoding process in a little bit. So if I refresh in a second, oh, that's, let's, let's see what it's doing. So it's not, it's not there immediately, which is, makes sense. The, the web interface has responded immediately to us, so we've got a nice snappy user interface. If we go and click in here, we can see the media processing panel. Oop, oh, it's already done in, while I was talking. But what we would normally see here is that media is in processing, so it's going through, it's converting it into a good format to publish, um, which sounds straightforward enough, but this is actually a really important step. And if you've tried to publish audio or video or even images, you'll know that this is the most painful part of the process where, you know, technically, you people are all technical people, you can do all this sort of stuff and you know the formats and you probably can figure out how to use um, FFmpeg or AVConv or GStream or something like this to convert it into the right format, but it's not much fun, is it? And you've probably written it down somewhere and it's probably changed, the library's changed since you did it last time. So Media Goblin just does that with good settings for you, so you just don't have to think about it, which is really important when you want to focus on the media, not on the process. So our alarm is there, let's have a little look. And if sounds are working, so it's, it's processed the audio here and it's given us a, uh, uh, what do you call this, a spectrograph of the audio. So we can actually play it. So that's my son and I doing a chook impression. <clears throat> okay, so that's audio. Awesome. What else have we got? Uh, now I've shown you, oh, I'll show you, so I'm not going to actually upload the video, but we have one here already, pre-prepared. This is the video from the Free Software Foundation's 30th birthday celebration, just to show you that it works. Software is all around us, and sometimes inside us. I won't play much of that. It's a really nice video if you want to go and have a watch sometime. But we get this nice custom video player in HTML5 and JavaScript and all that sort of goodness. Unlike a lot of video uh, hosting systems, you can actually just right-click and uh, save, save the video, save video as, which is probably the way it should be, you know. Uh, <clears throat> the, the transcoding process is done by, done by Media Goblin with uh, GStreamer, which I'll talk a little bit about later. So we've got a link, this is a, also a demo of how the markdown works in the, in the uh, text, I'll just hit edit. We've added some, a link here in markdown so that you can actually just link through to, you know, the, where the work came from, which is the Free Software Foundation. Uh, I'll save that again. All right, so that's, so we've done photos, uh, audio and video. Let's, I've got one more demo for you. And this one, do I have one more? Yes, I, oh, I've got two more demos. Okay, so this one is slide hosting, so if you happen to be a speaker. So this is a tutorial that I did uh, a little while back. I won't do any description, set my license, whatever, yep. <clears throat> okay, so this is a PDF of some tutorial slides. Media Goblin's going and processing that now. If I refresh, there we go. So you get, thanks to the pdf.js uh, library, you can actually view this directly in the browser here. And this is fantastic if you happen to do talks and you want to put up the video and you want to put up the slides right next to it, you can host it all on your system. One more demo. Okay, uh, this one, is a good friend of mine, Alex Fraser, uh, has written a game called Cargo. It's a free software 3D game written in Blender. It's about a, a snail who goes and delivers post, which you should totally look up. Um, I think the website is http cargo.smidgen, let's see. Uh, if I can type cargo, that's it. Cargo at Smidgen software. So go and, go and play that. Um, this is a 3D model, um, and I'll pop up the what's going on in the background. So this is Media Goblin talking to Blender in the background. You know, Blender, the 3D modeling program. It's actually calling Blender as a command line program and asking it to render some shots 
of this 3D model. Okay, so it's done now. I'll flick back here. And there we have our snail. So this, is a, this was a 3D STL file, which you might use to do 3D printing or something like that. Uh, this is a, screen's a little bit tight, but uh, you'll see down the bottom we have some, slot, uh, some slots to take a look at a different view of it. So there's the front, there's the top. These are all pre-rendered in Blender, side, and then there's this amazing WebGL version too. So there you go, there's your Thingiverse. And this was written as a plugin by uh, Jessica Talon in a very short time, uh, which was fantastic, as a, uh, in a competition to, to get a, uh, a, what is, a 3D printer uh, that was given away as a bounty for this plugin. So it, it really came together quite quickly, which is amazing. So there you go, you can also, if you want to print it, you can download the model. Awesome. Uh, so yes, anyway. Uh, okay, let's get back to where we were. Okay, so as I've mentioned, it's centered around you, not the media type. So it's not just a supermarket of videos or slides or 3D models, that sort of stuff. So you get total control over that. You can run all of them or just one of them. You can run ASCII art if you really want to. And it runs on a machine that you control. So anything, you know, any, if you have a machine connected to the internet, you can run this piece of software. It could be at home, it could be on a virtual server, or something like that. So, still though, you might not be the right person for Media Goblin. Uh, if, if you're just looking for a hands-off, you know, approach to publishing your, your media, and if you're not really expressing anything challenging or unusual, uh, and you're not really concerned about where your data lives, and you don't mind the sort of generic user experience you get from some of these large sites, then maybe Media Goblin's not for you. But this is the general architecture we, you know, conceptual architecture of some of these large sites. So YouTube, Flickr, SoundCloud, Thingiverse, SlideShare. They look like this, one big silo of all the data and us all connected around the outside. Uh, and this is a powerful architecture if you're a large um, media or advertising company, uh, it keeps all your uh, contributors, all, all, your, all your users, locked in, and it's very hard for people to exit because everything is in your system and they can't get things out easily. It's a really good architecture if you want to implement surveillance, uh, which most do. It's easy to censor and remove unpopular or challenging material. And it's also easy to profile and data mine the hell out of all your visitors. Uh, and if you happen to be the, the world's largest um, advertising companies, then this is a very good thing. It's also easy to write broad, sweeping, automatic copyright infringement detection that's fairly simplistic and is based on keywords. And it pushes all of the work back onto the the user to, to defend and make sure their media gets reinstated when it's taken down for a, a possible copyright infringement. So in this architecture, you're in a really weak position. Your interests or the interests of minorities don't really matter to the company. And let's be honest, even the interests of the majorities don't really matter if they conflict with the company's business interests or the, publisher, the, the large media publishers' interests or the interests of government agencies, for example. And it's the cloud in the vaguest sense of the word in that you have no idea where your media lives. And what happens when the lights go out? Where does the world's media go? Just due to this architecture, it's large, large for-profit companies aren't good custodians of our cultural works. And whether it's a big bang disappearance or the slow erosion of unpopular media being taken down, things being removed for copyright, potential copyright infringement, uh, one day things just start going away. The other thing that concerns me personally is 
really that we're viewing our, our view of this world, of the world becomes through these, the view of these large companies and their automated popularity systems and the profiling and all this sort of stuff. So we, rich, we, 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 uh, we risk losing all this diversity and richness in our media that uh, from coming from the, the material that's not so popular or um, is a little bit challenging or politically un unfavorable at the time. So what we get through these automatic popularity rankings is this kind of bland mainstream culture without all these unique perspectives. I mean, do you even remember what the world was like without YouTube? We, we do, probably, but uh, there'll be people very shortly who won't. So Media Goblin is a project to design, it's more than just a media hosting system, it's a project to design modern freedom respecting network services. The idea is that rather than having one big silo of all the information, the, the project is about scaling down, and that's scaling down to an individual, a family, or a community, or an organization, or something like that. You run your own system. And now is the right time for this sort of, this sort of system, because uh, we have affordable, low-power hardware that we can run. We can, we can buy that. You know, it's reasonably affordable. Um, and we have, particularly in Australia, with this sort of slow uptake of high-speed networking with the NBN and this sort of stuff. <laughs> so we can now start to uh, we can start to produce, like, run these systems ourselves and choose to host our media in ways that serve our own interests rather than the interests of large companies. The other thing is that you get to determine the terms of service for your site. So you can have just media hosted by you, but you can also invite other people to use your system as well. Um, give them accounts if you want. And you get to decide what's appropriate on your site and what's not. So your views matter in this case. You also get to decide where the work is hosted. So if you, are, if you wanted to host something in your house so that uh, particular privacy issues were respected or uh, you could avoid, the, avoid storing monitoring information about who accessed the service or you could run it over Tor or something like this. Well, maybe not. Don't host videos over Tor, perhaps. But um, you, you get full choice over this. If you want to host it in another country, that's fine too. So. I'll talk a little bit about the technology behind all this. Media Goblin is a little bit, well, it's a Python uh, web application, so it's HTML, JavaScript, Python, uh, and it runs on the server side. It's a little bit Django-ish if you're a Python person, you might be familiar with Django. The architecture is similar, but it's not Django as such. So here's a, here's a sort of technical drawing of the architecture of Media Goblin. So these are the, uh, this is, out the front we have the goblins uh, serving the media. These are the, these are processes running that I started up in that first window there. These are the processes that actually serve the web interface and the APIs, which I'll talk about in a second. And then behind the scenes we have some goblins locked up to do all the transcoding uh, and processing of the media. Thankfully this is a project about free software, not about free goblins. Uh, did I skip one? No, there we go. So the, the project is built on uh, a whole lot of technologies, and I'm not going to show you them all, but these are a few of the picks that I thought you might find interesting. Uh, we use the Ginger 2 templating engine, uh, WTF, WT forms for form validation, WorkSug, which is the WSGI interface library that we're using, SQL Alchemy for the database ORM type system, Postgres or SQLite. Celery and Kombu do the, the task queuing and the processing for the, the goblins in the cage. They, they, they manage the, uh, the, the task queue and then the goblins just take the, 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 the things off the task queue. And as of a few versions ago, we've upgraded to GStreamer 1.0, which is a really substantial upgrade. So if you've, if you've tried Media Goblin in the past and had a few problems with uh, processing certain types of video from your, you know, your or camera or something like this, it's a good time to give it another try because GStreamer 1 has uh, a lot more compatibility with a whole range of videos and doing thumbnailing and stuff like that. Uh, we also have early Python 3 support, which is really exciting because I like Python 3. 
And as I mentioned earlier, the, the encoding settings, you can tweak them if you'd like to, but there's really good encoding settings built in for GStreamer and this sort of stuff. Media Goblin is also a GPL version three, which is, in our opinion, the best, uh, the best license choice for software that's mainly run as a network service. The web interface is only one way of accessing Media Goblin. There's also uh, a, an API, which uh, you, may have, you may have heard of the Pump IO um, social network uh, that's taken off somewhat in the free software community. Uh, Media Goblin has a Pump IO compatible interface. The, the technical word for that is JSON Activity Streams uh, 1.0. So uh, I'll show you a little bit of this. This is an example. I, it doesn't really matter what this says. This is essentially uh, saying that Chris uh, posted an image. And this is what will be transmitted between the client and the Media Goblin server API. Uh, it's, it's assuming that we already have done the OAuth authentication process so the client knows who this is. So I'll give you a little demo of this. So I use, a, I use the pump.io system for my social networking needs, um, but we can also, because this is a pump.io compatible system, fire up pump.io and use it as a client for Media Goblin. Now the interesting thing here is that pump.io doesn't know anything about Media Goblin. The author of pump.io may not have even heard of Media Goblin, and we're gonna use it here to post information to our Media Goblin server. So what I just did is I started up a new Pump.io instance. This is the, the setup wizard. Uh, I'll put in my, uh, my web finger details. So it's Ben at 127.0.16543. Okay, so that's just kicked off the OAuth process, which has communicated with Media Goblin in the background uh, to, to do the OAuth stuff and then given me an authorization screen here. So it's popped up a web browser to say, are you okay if this Pump.io client accesses your Media Goblin account as you, essentially? So we'll click okay, that sounds good to me. Uh, gives us a bit of text here that we need to paste into Pumper. Where's Pumper gone? There we are. Paste that in here. Finish. <clears throat> okay, Pumper will just do its thing. And now, without any particular Media Goblin stuff, uh, this client can actually see all the things we've done here. The interface needs a little bit of usability uh, pizzazz, but uh, it's, it's working. Um, so what's exciting is that, let's flip back to the web browser. If I go back here and I add a comment, cute snail. Add this comment. So my comment's down here. If I flick back to Pumper and wait a second, fingers crossed, it should come up. Oh well, maybe uh, technical glitches there. Um, we'll, we'll try it back the other way perhaps. Um, so. This is our cake here, I'll uh, click comment. I love cake. If I hit send message, we can actually post back to our cake. Let's go and find our cake. There we go, so I like cake too and I love cake. Um, the other thing we can do uh, is because Pumper already knows about image sending, we can send images directly to Media Goblin. So if I find my way back to my, there we go, upload. Let's, uh, this will do, Goblin. Yay, Goblins. There we go, so Pump has posted that to Media Goblin in the background. And let's go and have a look and see what's going on in here. Yeah, there we go, so there's our Goblin. So this is really significant because it suddenly opens up the ecosystem with an existing standard technology for, for people to use Media Goblin. We're not reinventing the wheel here. <clears throat> and 
I seem to be in the wrong place. Good. So that's using, that's the, the kind of interface for people using the system as such. Um, recently, there's also been some really useful features come in to do things that like a system administrator might want to do, or a person running a conference and doing videos in a conference might want to do, which is things like uploading videos from the back end and reprocessing and things like this. So this is an example where you can actually just take a file that you already have on disk on the server perhaps, so you might transfer all your media to the server in bulk, or you know, plug a, a USB drive into it, and then you run GNU Media Goblin, add media, the username, and then the, the media itself. Uh, so that's the first one. You can also add all the metadata you want there as well, which is great, and you could do that in batch if you wanted to. Excuse me. There's also a bulk upload feature, so if you have hundreds of videos, you can put them in a CSV file and import that one directly, just telling it where the files are and all the media, the, the, the multimedia, like the, the metadata that you have for those. Uh, <clears throat> the, there's settings that you can use to avoid retranscoding the media, so if you've already done the transcoding on a more powerful machine or uh, a cluster of machines or something like that, you can do that ahead of time and not have to reprocess it on the web server or your whatever you've delegated your media goblin processing to. And if you've had issues uh, doing the transcoding for some reason, you haven't, maybe you didn't install the right library or something, or you didn't enable the right plugin, and the media is sitting in Media Goblin's queue saying, hey, I can't, I, I, I failed at, at transcoding this, you can actually re tell it to kick off using the command line, kick off the, the transcoding again, which is just, just makes the experience really nice. So if, you've, if you have tried Media Goblin before and you've wanted some of these features, then here they are. So other features, uh, we have thank you, uh, things like reporting and moderation. So if uh, your terms of service happen to you know, conflict with something that someone's posted, they can post a report and you, can, you have the workflow to do that. So you can respond to that, respond to the person who posted, take the media down if you need to. We have tagging, which works uh, both across users and uh, with the same user, so you could say, I'd like to see all Ben's photos of cake, or you could say, I'd like to see all the photos of cake. We also have collections, which is a nicer way to say, this is all of Ben's videos about Media Goblin. So you can put a title and a description and things like this. Um, so it might be, well, it wouldn't be all of Ben's photos, uh, videos of Media Goblin, it would be anyone's videos of Media Goblin, or anyone's LCA 2016 videos. There's automatic geocoding, of photos, so if your camera does does GIS, uh, uh, GPS stamping of photos, you, you get a nice little map on the side. There's visual theming, you can add your own theme or there's a few built in. You get to choose your default license, so although you can choose it every time you upload media, you can also uh, set one so that you get the same license all the time, you don't have to keep selecting it. There's also lots of authorization support, so if you, if you use Persona, or use OpenID, or you plug into something bigger, like an LDAP server, you can use that too. So, that's where we are at the moment. We'll talk a little bit about where we're going in the future. So Media Goblin is a, is a young, but it's a very ambitious project uh, at the moment, which is beyond just hosting media. It's really about the social experience too. So, at the moment, the to-do list is Federation, uh, Finish 1.0, and then some other stuff as well. So I'd like to talk a little bit briefly about Federation uh, because that's something that hasn't been clear. It's been something that Media Goblin's wanted to do all the way along, which we don't have yet, but uh, it's, it's never quite been clear um, to, to, to many people what, what it actually means. So this is, what, this is, this is our, our key feature, really. This is what 1.0 will be. Uh, it's under, Federation is, well, Media Goblin is distributed in that you can run your own node, but it's not federated in that the nodes can talk to each other yet. So Jessica Talon is busy working on this at the moment. Uh, what it means is the social experience for Media Goblin. So it means you can post and comment and follow without having to have an account on each individual Media Goblin server. You'll have an account on your server, and that server will accept your comments and posts and all this sort of stuff 
and feed notifications and comments and such off to the, the server where they, they should end up. The best way to understand this is that it's a server-to-server -server technology as distinct from where, where we're running Pumper there and posting to, the, uh, posting to Media Goblin. It's actually between these two Media Goblin servers, which you've got on the screen here. So this might be my Media Goblin server and my friend's Media Goblin server. It's a technology that sits between these. That's what we're talking about when we talk about federation. For example, so commenting, uh, I might look at a piece of media on a remote server I'd write a comment. That comment actually flows through to my Media Goblin, uh, and my Media Goblin might take some action based on that comment, so it'll take a local copy of the comment and store it, and then it'll look at the, the activity streams JSON, and essentially without having to do all that much to it, it'll bunt it off to, to the remote Media Goblin server, and the remote Media Goblin server will look at it and say, Right, so first I need to do something on, uh, to set some state to say that this, this photo has a comment below it, and I also need to add it to the, the, the author's inbox so that they see it when they, they next log in with their client or with the, the web client. This is an example of what the activity streams might look like for that kind of thing. It doesn't really matter what it, the, the details don't matter so much. This is just saying Chris posted uh, a, an image. Here we have all the information about the, the authorization, not the authorization, but the identity information about Chris too. So this is essentially what is pushed around the, this Media Goblin network. It's, it's both a command language, so it says Chris posted the image and the server will do some action based on this. It's also a log language, so this, this fragment will also be pushed into Chris's inbox to say, so that Chris will know, uh, pushed into someone else's inbox who's a follower of Chris so that they know that Chris posted an image. Uh, the, as I said, the key point is that it, it really, uh, well, I mentioned that we can use existing pump clients for this. The other really interesting point is that if you have an existing Pump.io account, you can follow someone, or you will be able to follow someone on Media Goblin without having a Media Goblin account. So, Media Goblin will play really nicely with the existing network of Pump.io people, which is great if you're trying to really get traction on a, a social, on a, you know, a minority social network. Uh, we, we can't afford to start reinventing the wheel and starting with a new technology. We have to build on what we've got. Uh, and this is a proven solid technology. <coughs> some of the, some of the um, so, so this is under active development at the moment. Some of the issues with implementing this sort of stuff is that for a relational database, uh, it's, it's difficult to say things like everything is an activity, but essentially the activity stream standard is saying that. It's saying that a post is an activity and a comment is an activity uh, and everything needs to be wrapped up like that. So it's taken a few interesting relational database tweaks to make that, that happen and that's been one of the hardest parts of, of retrofitting federation to Media Goblin. And that's, for, for if you're interested in the details, that's it's been implemented a little bit like the Django um, generic models things where you've got a text field with, a, with an ID and another field that tells you what model the activity belongs to. Media Goblin isn't just about the technology, as I said. So it's also about this, uh, the social process. And Media Goblin's working really hard uh, to, to bring some standards behind this because, you know, because we are the underdogs in, in the social media world. Um, Chris, Chris Weber and Jessica Tallon, uh, in this photo, Jessica's in the pink and the black, and Chris is directly above her. They've been participating for the last uh, year or so uh, in the W3C social working group, so they've been meeting regularly with these folks uh, and working on, the, on a whole range of standards, including Activity Streams 2, the next version from what we've got here, uh, which will be in JSON LD format. And it'll be a big upgrade over 1.0, but relatively compatible. So it's not going to be a, a huge change to Media Goblin, we hope. Um, it's based on a thorough analysis of all the existing social networks. Uh, and it also includes some other sub protocols like. Activity Pump, uh, and a few that they're bunching under the, the IndieWeb um, name called WebMention, 
micropub and post type discovery for the details. And these are actually progressing through the W3C at the moment, and uh, we've had a couple come through to edit it from move from working draft to editor's draft, um, such as micropub, which was came through last week, which is very exciting. So they're doing really great work to bring standards to social networking based on existing technology. This is uh, another thing that uh, another tool in the in the toolbox for Media Goblin. It's a, an Android app that's being worked on by Dylan Jeffers. It's called Goblinoid. It's under heavy development at the moment. It's quite an interesting project because it's using Kivi and Python and a library called uh, PyPump, uh, and it has some interesting challenges, technical challenges, in bringing Kivi into a a build system like the F-Droid free software uh, Android hosting system. Deployment is also something that Media Goblin's working well thinking very hard about and working on. Because probably as you know, if you work in Python, Python deployment is still a hard thing. It's not something that people can just go out and grab their, you know, plug in their, their, um, their Media Goblin server and up it comes. I mean, for example, I had to, uh, a friend said to me, hey, I'd like, a, I'd like something like you've got to, to host photos of my, my baby. Um, and I, I've been really busy, and I had to say to them, look, I'm sorry, I just, I don't have time. I'd love to, but I don't have time. And that's what we want to be able to solve. We want this to be available to everyone who wants it. We'd like it to be in distros, uh, and that presents its own challenges. Things like version pinning of Python packages don't play so well, so there's some interesting challenges there. Um, no hard and fast answers for you yet, but things like GNU Geeks, G-U-I-X, uh, are looking to be good solutions for this. So that said, Media Goblin is directly turning your money into free software. Uh, the work that Jessica Talon's doing on Federation is 100% funded by your donations for the last campaign. These are great developers, and because Media Goblin is stewarded by the FSF as a charity, they're legally, the organization is legally obliged to serve in the public interests. So please, donate to Media Goblin, become an associate member of the FSF, and I'd also encourage you to support our good friends at the Software Freedom Conservancy, which are the, the home, the administrative home for a whole range of projects. Uh, you probably haven't heard of them, things like Git, Samba, Inkscape, Wine, Busybox, Mercurial. So please, become a, an associate member of the FSF, become a supporter of the Software Freedom Conservancy, and donate to Media Goblin. Media Goblin is media hosting for artists. So if you're a pixel artist, you write research papers, you do meetup recordings, you do podcasts, stop motion animation, talk at conferences, photograph food, produce screencasts of, of, thing, of your work, or you're growing your own hacker baby, Media Goblin is for you. So, go make something amazing and host it on Media Goblin. Thank you. Any While the mics are wandering around, I'll just say, my, my day job is as a free software developer. I, I run 100% free software in my business, and I do, um, Python and JavaScript web applications for organizations who are looking to automate some of their business processes. So if that's your thing, come and talk to me. Hi, um, great project by the look of it. The first thing that occurred to me when I saw it is, can I get a Kodi add-on that'll talk to this? Can you get a coding error? Add-on, yeah. When? Okay, uh, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really understand the question, I'm okay. sorry. That's do you mean can Media Goblin handle errors in the media itself, or? No, sorry, no. Cody. I don't know Cody. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not familiar with XBMC. <laughs> right, right. So no. <laughs> um, I've actually been looking for something remotely like this with respect to supporting researchers in Australia, um, and I had one come to me recently with a interesting problem which was he was collecting photos of aboriginal rock art and when you say photos most people think you whip out a dlsr and you take a 20 megapixel photo but no he's actually talking photos that are 128,000 pixels square right so obviously this isn't a single file it's a composite file of lots of photos joined together have you ever thought about doing 
composite images or had a request to do so or you know do you think even the system could handle it if we were to you know even if i were to find resources to go then code it in if someone were to write a plugin for it that would be something that's certainly possible because there's the technology to scale out the back end processing of media um, that could certainly be done it doesn't work at the moment but we'd love to see something like that yeah uh, you mentioned it does transcoding of everything. Does it have multiple copies? What's it like on disk space? If I put a 100 meg video up there, how much disk space is that actually going to take by, by the time it's finished processing it? Yeah, so the, the default settings, I, I can't remember the resolution, but it does its transcoding to its specific set web resolution in one, one size at the moment, and it'll actually delete the original file. If it's a video, uh, I think it keeps the original for images and possibly for audio too. Uh, and the originals are still useful for obviously for 3D models and PDFs. So um, you'll still need disk space and you'll still need lots of processing power and you'll still need bandwidth is the answer, I guess. Uh, while, while it's transcoding, you'll, you'll need 200% of the original, yes. But then once it's done, you, uh, that'll be gone and you'll be back to less than 100% usually. Hi, Ben. Uh, you mentioned that the um, op the WebGL um, view the three D model thing was a plugin uh, written in response to a bounty. Have there been other plugins written in response to bounties? Is there a bit of a bounty market for Media Goblin plugins, or is that something that you're looking to foster? Yeah, I'd love to see that. So this was written in as a the bounty was given by a three D printing company. That could certainly be a way to to get people, you know, it was win a 3D printer that's worth $1,000 or so, so it's certainly a, very attractive to, to someone who's excited about this technology but has never done some 3D printing. So, yeah, it's, it's clearly a, a good pro, uh, approach to, to getting people to, to write plugins for things like this for, you know, small, achievable stuff, yeah. Hi, Ben. I would just... You mentioned the AGPL v3 license and you said that was the best for this or in your opinion, most suitable for this kind of project. I just wonder if you could outline what features of that license make it sure. suitable for this kind of project. So, so, so what happens with a GPL project is if you put it on as a network service, uh, you don't actually have to provide the four freedoms to the person through, through a web browser. If they're just interacting with it over a network, they don't, you're running the software, not them. So you don't have to give them the source code and give them ability to modify it and all this sort of stuff. So uh, the AGPL adds a requirement that you have to provide them a link to download through the network service the, the actual source that you're using. So, and if they reuse your, your code, they're obliged when they publish it to also add a link. So I'll just show you here. You'll see right down the bottom here this links directly to the Media Goblin Savannah uh, Git repository. And if I modified Media Goblin substantially and published it, I'd also need to link to my changes there to be in compliance with the AGPL. Thank you very much for that. Um, can everybody give a warm congratulations to Ben for his contribution? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.